to click it. And then the other thing I want to name is at different points on this call, we're going to be uh, sharing a screen and some slides. And if you've been on Zoom for a little bit in the last couple of months, you know, there's been a Zoom update and you might need to click the now Shana is sharing her computer screen at the very top, whenever that moment is, I'll make sure to prompt you. But if it feels like I'm referencing some slides and you can't see them, just click the button at the very top. Um, and I also just want to highlight both the conversation and the fundraising component of this call tonight. Sunrise has set a goal of raising $20,000 by the end of this week to continue our voter contact operation and to win this election. And you can play a critical role in that. We've already raised $5,000 earlier in this week and we're trying to close out those last 15. And I'm hopeful and excited that we can get a good chunk of the way there on this very call tonight. So if at any point during this call, you feel inspired, excited, or ready to defeat Donald Trump with Sunrise Pack, you can go to the link in the chat smvmt.link backslash turnout to make a donation. It's the exact same link that you use to register. And so feel free to go there and donate at any point in time. The last thing I want to name on this thread is if you make a donation on this call, I might get a DM and give you a shout out on this call to say thank you so much, blank person, for your donation. And before we continue on, I want to give a moment for our folks Rebecca, Yara, and Ayana to share a little bit about themselves and introduce themselves. Let's take it away, Rebecca. Ah, unmuted. Hello, everybody. Super exciting to be here. I've been a huge fan of Sunrise since forever. And as for this election, oh my God, it's kind of deciding the fate of this country, which is the fate of this world, which is, you know, oh God, I'm getting this weird pop up, but you know, this is a make it or break it for where we go from here. I don't want to spend another four years just trying to stave off the apocalypse that's Donald Trump. And I think we'll just be done with MAGA if we win this one big thing. So we got to do it. We're going to do it. I love seeing all the energy this time around and love seeing you all showing up here. Fantastic. Glad to have you in it. Ayanna, you want to take it away? Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you. I've been following along with Sunrise's wonderful work um, since the very beginning, um, and I'm glad to see how it's all evolving. Um, I want the better climate candidate to win in every, every election, up and down the ballot. I think we need to make sure we're encouraging people to, like, have that as a filter on local elections too. So everything Rebecca said, and then just add that in because that's where the rubber bit hits the road on a lot of the implementation stuff that we need to see. Fantastic, thank you for sharing. I wanna hand it off for Yara to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Yara Cheng at Levin, they, them. I have been throwing down with Sunrise Movement in electoral work since I was 15 years old. And now that I'm 20 and I'm a college student, it has also been exactly one month today since I joined Sunrise staff as campaign organizer. And right, in the election, I'm going to defeat Trump and make sure we overturn Missouri's abortion ban, where I'm from. Fantastic. Let's win both those things. All right. Before we continue forward, I want to give you a sense of where we're headed tonight. Now, Shin, if I could get the slides. Uh, that was my prompt to you. If you don't see the slides right now, click that button at the top of your screen. Uh, and the flow for our night is, we're gonna be doing some intros that we just did. We're going to hear a story from Yara about why they're organizing this election cycle. I'm gonna give you a quick overview of our general election work and Sunrise's long-term strategy. And then we're gonna get into the meat of our production, or I should say the vegan meat of our production, our roundtable conversation with our three gate speakers. And then finally, at the very end, it'll come down to your time to shine, i.e. I will give you, I'll be giving you an ask uh, for our election needs. Uh, and so that's a sense of where we'll be headed for the rest of the night. And I want to hand it off to Yara to tell a personal story. Yara is a 20-year-old climate organizer who's been in our movement since they were 15 years old. They have been fighting and organizing on our Force to Be Reckoned With team, which is our team that's done millions of voter contact attempts uh, for general election, for our primaries, defending the squad, and many other moments. And yeah, Yara, take it away. Thanks so much, Kinas. Um, 
To be honest, I am on this call and I am in Sunrise Moon because I know how it feels to be in seventh grade when you lose an election to Donald Trump. When I was 12 years old, I was going to a seventh or 12th grade school in St. Louis, Missouri, where I had plenty of Trump kids and Hillary Clinton kids and kids who don't know how elections work all in my middle school together. And there was an English classmate of mine, a little blonde kid who considered himself politically active. And for us at, at that age, that meant he would stay up late watching SNL skits about the 2016 presidential election and then talk about them in class. So we learned over the first few weeks and months of school that like which of our classmates really, really wanted Trump to lose. And we were pretty sure he was gonna because it was gonna be fine, right? The adults told us it was gonna be fine. Um, I stayed up as late as I could on election night with my family watching the results, but the election still wasn't decided when it hit like 10 p.m. and I was 12 and I was tired. I got up at 3 a.m. just to check my phone and I saw that Trump had lost, that, that Trump had won. We had lost and I went back to sleep. The next morning at school, I was getting stuff from my locker, ready for the day, and my friend from English was just standing in the middle of the hallway crying. Um, I couldn't even hear him. He was talking so softly. I couldn't hear him over the noise of lockers slamming shut and people moving past. But when I tried to ask him what was wrong, he just looked at me and he had tears. And he said, Yara, what do we do now? I'll be honest, I was 12 and not sure how to answer that question. But I was raised by a mom who is a Gen X activist. So I just told him we get to work. And for middle schoolers, that looks like we get to school work. We talked about Trump's policies in our classes. My Muslim friends uh, wrote speeches for speech and debate class about the travel ban. We wrote term papers in our eighth grade social studies class, and everyone fought for dibs on climate change at the topic. I ended up with immigration and also wrote about the Trump administration's policies on the border. Um, but feeling like we couldn't impact national policy. If I wanted to make a difference, I just decided to run for class president at my school. And that was the year where I fought Trump's policies and Trump's America in my own school. That was the year that I organized a gun violence walkout in my school as class president. When a hate group, the Westboro Baptist Church, was picketing outside of my school, they were holding up signs with anti-LGBTQ slurs on them. I helped organize the school's counter protest. And I was in 10th grade when we were coming up on the 2020 election, and I knew this was the chance that I had to make not all of my high school experience a Trump administration. I was ready to throw down whatever that looked like. I wasn't going to sit out another election like I did when I was in seventh grade. And so because I had the Sunrise Movement, because I clicked every sign up link I possibly could on a sunrise welcome call. I talked to my hub leaders in St. Louis. Because of that, I know how it feels to be in high school when you win an election against Donald Trump. I joined Force to be Reckoned With in 10th grade. I eventually became team lead with two other 16 year old girls and we kind of skipped our Zoom school classes to just do phone banking all the time. We made over 6.5 million voter contacts in the primaries and the general election, creating the largest youth turnout in history. I phone banked during school. My teachers didn't notice I was gone. And the ones that did, they knew it was for something more important than Latin class. I completed homework in between my conversations on the dialer with voters. Or when I was a volunteer trainer for a shift, I would do my homework while waiting for volunteers to ask me questions. I phone banked on my 17th birthday during the Georgia runoffs with, with people wishing me happy birthday in the chat alongside asking specific questions about the dialer. I held smaller virtual phone banks for down ballot candidates with other Sunrisers at my school. And I built a community with the phone banking team. These are the people who helped me realize that I was queer, that they were the first people I came out to and they made me wanna keep organizing with Sunrise after the election. Because we won when I was in a 11th grade, I get to spend my last two years of high school and my first years of college pushing the Biden administration for the climate policies that we need. Um, I spent a year working on the Good Jobs for All campaign with my friends. It was so fun, so hype, and we blockaded the White House in June 2021, my first in-person action with Sunrise. Within a few years, we won that demand and we got an American Climate Corps. So now that I've seen both scenarios, where we lose an election against Trump and where we win the election against Trump, um, when I couldn't even vote, I know 
what both administrations can mean for our climate justice organizing. And I am very clear in what I want to do this year when I finally can vote in my first presidential election. But even more importantly than learning what kind of administration is better organizing terrain, the biggest lesson I learned from Sunrise was not to estimate the youth, the, not to underestimate the youth vote and youth volunteer power. This year, once again, the phone making team that I support on staff is primarily led by high school students, uh, taking time away from their practices, rehearsals, and homework to throw down three days a week phone banking. And if you are ready to donate so that my friends on this high school team can change the outcome of this selection, I want to see you drop a star in the chat. That would make my day. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I love that John put the word star literally in the chat. And I'll pass it back to Kitas. Thank you so much, Yara, for telling that beautiful story. And thank you, everyone, for getting those donations rolling in. Um, uh, we've already raised a couple hundred dollars tonight. Uh, I'm seeing that Rebecca herself donated $600 in the last couple of minutes. So I want to give a shout out to Rebecca, one of our speakers, for making that donation. Deeply appreciated. And yeah, also want to shout out the folks like Miles and Marcia and Elizabeth and Jock and Aru and John and Deborah and others for making donations. We have crossed the six and a half thousand dollars mark. We began around five thousand dollars earlier on this call. Thank you so much for making our organizing possible. Next, actually, I want to just just say again, Yara, that was a genuinely beautiful story. And I know I heard it earlier, but hearing it again is still just as powerful. And I'm really glad that you're in our movement. Um, uh, okay. All righty. For the next little bit, I wanted to explain some of the incredible work folks like Yara and other young folks in our movement are doing to win this election and fight for the movement that's building the Green New Deal. Uh, if I could get the slides... Uh, that's once again my prop to you that if you can't see the sides, it's your moment to click the button at the top. Uh, and yeah, we're going to begin by just getting a general sense of Sunrise's general election operation and talk about our long-term strategy before we pivot into our roundtable. Sunrise is on a mission to defeat Donald Trump, elect Kamala Harris, and grow our base and win more climate action. Our general election work actually began a couple of weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, with phone and text. We've also just been talking to voters in critical states like Michigan, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and beyond. And this very Saturday, in two days, we're going to begin hitting doors in places like Arizona. So the general election work is fully on its way and occurring. And if you're wondering, our general election work functionally falls into three different buckets. Our electoral work, our narrative work, and our base building work. Um, we are planning to make millions of voter contact attempts. At this point, a couple of weeks in, we've already made about a quarter million voter contact attempts chatting with young people in critical swing states to win this election. And we plan to continue doing it. And that's where your money is going. The other critical things we're trying to do is make climate action a key issue in this election. We recognize that what makes Democrats and Kamala Harris so different from Republicans and Donald Trump is their rejection of big oil and fighting for everyday folks on the campaign trail. And we want to highlight that difference through all of our comms work and narrative shifting work that we do. We also want to just highlight the climate wins that folks like Sunrise and orgs like Sunrise have done to win critical things like the American Climate Corps and pass the Inflation Reduction Act, our country's first major climate bill, but not last. Uh, and lastly, we want to be growing our base across race and class to absorb new voters and new organizers Every day, there are dozens of young people joining Sunrise trying to figure out how to make a difference in this election. How do I win the future that me and my family deserve? And we want to be the movement home for them. We are training and prepping our base to take action before and after the election. No matter what the outcomes are on November 5th, Sunrisers will be mobilizing to fight for their futures. We will be ready in the case of a contested election if Trump is not willing to concede. We're ready for Kamala Harris to win and to push her to be the next climate president that young people deserve. And we're also ready in the inopportune situation where Trump wins and we need to mobilize to defend our wins. And I want to highlight some of the examples of how we're going to be fighting electorally, narratively, and building our base on the next slide. Uh, some key highlights are we are doing some mega canvases 
with partnering youth orgs like Gen Z for Change, March for Our Lives, and United We Dream. We're going to be doing a couple hundred person canvases in places like Phoenix to get out the youth vote, talk to folks on college campuses, talk to young people who just turned 18, and also just talk to regular voters at their doors. Um, we are bringing back Victory Squad. If you don't know what Victory Squad is, it is an internal movement competition. Sunrisers form teams to compete with one another to see who can talk to the most amount of voters. They get a very beautiful victory cup at the end of this election. It'll have like their team name embezzled on it. It's a really fun internal competition. Um, we will be doing some relational organizing. If you don't know what I mean by relational organizing, it is young people in swing states talking to their everyday family members about voting and why it's important. The thing that makes Sunrise different is the fact that we are organizing year round at any moment, whether it's an election year or not. Our local organizers are running campaigns for transit, housing, uh, improving their communities. And so it's really natural for them to go from knocking their neighbor's door to talk about why they need to pass the bond policy to increase affordable housing, like folks are doing in Dallas, to talking to their friends and family about why they should um, vote this November. Uh, and yeah, just keeping in mind that like one person just has like hundreds of contacts in their phone. And so every single organizer uh, in Sunrise that lives in a swing state is doing critical work of turning out their friends and family. Uh, and if you've been with us for a long time, you know that at Sunrise, we love direct actions. Uh, we'll be targeting folks at the presidential level, but we'll also be targeting folks at the Senate level. Uh, and the reason for this is we're here to win climate legislation, and we know that the makeup of the Senate and the House is critical to the wins that we're going to need to notch in the next couple of years. So some of the folks that we'll be targeting are folks like Carrie Lake. She is running uh, to be the senator from Arizona. Uh, she doubts climate change. She is taking money from big oil. She says incredibly ridiculous things as she's campaigning. And the current sitting senator, uh, Florida, Rick Scott as well, who also is a climate denier. Uh, and so we'll be having sunrisers in places like Arizona and Florida confronting them on the campaign trail, uh, demanding that they reject big oil money and letting voters know that these are not the candidates that are fighting for working people. Uh, and so that's a quick snapshot of some of the things we're going to be doing in our general election work. Uh, it takes, quite frankly, I know it's always cheesy to say, but a village to make Sunrise's organizing occur. And we've got 50 something days to win this election and continue fighting for our political terrain. Uh, I also want to just give you a quick sense of the organizing Sunrise is going to be doing on a multi-year timeline, uh, which functionally boils down to vote, organize, strike. Uh, and Sunrise, we recognize that to win big and to win bigger and better uh, legislation, uh, that we're going to do more. We're going to need to do more than just voting or just organizing or taking direct action. We're going to need to use all of our tools and our toolbox to win the Green New Deal. Uh, and so I want to tell you a little bit more about the key components of voting, organizing, and striking for the Green New Deal and our multi-year plan to win. Uh, for us, it means recognizing that the next 50 something days are incredibly critical to making sure that we defeat Donald Trump, but also recognizing that there are other elections on our horizon that we're going to be organizing for. So for us, that means the 2026 midterms and keeping in mind that we want to grow and expand the squad. It means winning races in purple districts to make sure that the Green New Deal is viable everywhere, not just in safe blue seats. And keeping in mind that there will be another presidential election in just a couple of years that we're going to be organizing to get a Green New Deal candidate into office. At the same time, we're going to be organizing. We're going to have our base of thousands of young people uh, that spans race, class, and geography uh, talking to their neighbors and other young people to popularize the Green New Deal and win their local campaigns. Um, we have spent the last couple of years running campaigns around issues that impact everyday people's lives. So for example, I live in Dallas. A couple of years ago, we ran a local campaign to um, make transit free for folks under 18, and we won it. Uh, and now we're running a housing campaign uh, to create more affordable housing. Uh, and so continuing the critical work of building the Green New Deal from the bottom up. And then finally, it's also going to require strikes. And so I want you to put a star in the chat if you have ever heard of the Nancy Pelosi sit-in. Okay, Victoria's heard of the Nancy Pelosi sit-in. Deborah's heard of it. 
Karen has heard of it. Alexis has heard of it. Rebecca, Natalie, Kate. Okay, a lot of folks have heard of the sit-in. Um, one of the things that makes Sunrise special is not just that we do election work. It's not just that we talk to our neighbors. It's also that we continue a tradition of taking direct action to fight for our futures. This is a tradition that comes out of the civil rights movement, from labor organizing and many other places. And we recognize that in the next couple of years, Sunrisers are gonna have to continue taking direct action to create the political triggers, stuff like the Nancy Pelosi sit-in and do it at a much larger and larger scale. For us, that looks like continuing to organize with middle school and high school students, college students and young folks in their communities to do school strikes and, take lo and do local takeovers and take higher levels of escalation to win the policies that we need. Uh, and so we're doing all of this work to get to our big goal. Next slide, please. We're doing this to win big legislation from the federal government. Uh, I recognize that the IRA was just a, a deeply profound win for our movements. We went from not being able to pass any policy at the federal level to passing hundreds of billions of dollars. And in a couple of years, I can't wait to be on another one of these Zoom calls saying, remember that peanut bill, the IRA? Uh, and how we won that much, much bigger bill just one or two years after that. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm, you know, that's what, keeping, that's what keeps me up in bed at night. Just thinking about like, ah, the bigger wins, the more legitimate wins that we could get in the next couple of years and the critical organizing we're going to be doing this election cycle to get to it. And you might be thinking, okay, Kitas, you've just presented like all these different concepts from voting to organizing to striking. What does it actually all mean right now in this year for Sunrise? For us, this year in Sunrise, it means training and organizing our base to be ready to defend the election. It means getting them prepped to knock doors. And it also means capitalizing on the moments where young people and people in general are paying attention to the climate crisis. And so one of the ways that we're striking and taking direct action is by capitalizing on the heartbreaking fact that climate disasters are getting worse. So this is just me highlighting one of the key ways that we've been organizing this year. Uh, and one of the things we've been doing is just in moments of disasters, having young sunrisers taking action to highlight, wow, extreme heat in Phoenix, having 115 degree days for a whole month is actually incredibly unnatural and should not be occurring. Highlighting that the fossil fuel industry is making that possible, highlighting that politicians are being bought out by the fossil fuel industry to continue making floods, hurricanes, and storms worse. And so I want to take a moment to show us a video about Sunrise's kind of disaster actions training and the kind of critical work we're going to be continuing this year and beyond. We don't need the news to tell us the climate crisis is here. We all have stories. There's the time the sky turned orange and we walked outside to stare straight at the sun. There's the day the waters kept rising, the week our neighborhood lost power for days. Our generation knows what it's like to live with dread sitting in our gut. We see our friends, we find joy and meaning and humor, but it's always with that undercurrent, the ticking clock. In our lifetimes, how bad's it gonna get? Two wildfires are heading toward a village in southern New Mexico and forcing people to leave their homes. Millions without power and flooding is an issue as a heat advisory could be underway today. When disaster strikes, they put our pain on the news, but why not the cause? We know the names of the men who are killing us. Before we were even born, our government gave them the power to sacrifice our lives for profit. And now, we watch them burn our homes, our families, our health, whole towns, whole ecosystems, disposable. Because to them, working class lives, black and brown neighborhoods are just a price to be paid. Let the storms come, they say. We'll just build the walls higher. But there's something they can't control. They spend millions spreading lies and buying off politicians. Because when their disasters strike, we take care of each other. And we start asking, what's it actually going to take to keep each other safe? And that answer is a government that shows up for us instead of billionaires. It's millions of good green union jobs that can stop the crisis The big oil's never going to create. It's safe and affordable housing to keep the storms out. It's health care as the temperatures rise and protection from our bosses so we don't die of heat stroke on the job. It's a green and reliable power grid to keep the lights on. It's the future that we deserve. So it's time to take down the handful of men standing in its way. This year, every time disaster strikes, our generation says enough. 
Enough with the denial. Enough with our leaders saying there's nothing they can do. Big Oil is headed for the graveyard where an older generation buried big tobacco. It's already started. Chicago is going after Big Oil. California is filing a lawsuit against ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, Phillips, BP, and the, the American The students are calling on the Biden administration to declare a national climate emergency. I'm here for my family. I'm here for the people that I love. When we win a Green New Deal, when we take power from fossil fuel arsonists and their bought-out politicians, we'll show each other how to live without fear live without that dread. Enough. They don't have the power to kill us if the people say no. Wow. Every time that I watch that video, I kind of get some chills. Um, okay, if you felt inspired by watching that video, let me get an exclamation mark from you in the chat. Okay, seeing them come in, seeing a couple of folks dropping more than one exclamation mark. Okay, fantastic. If you're feeling spoken to by Sunrise's general election work, if you're feeling spoken to by our multi-year organizing plan, if you're feeling hopeful about our climate disaster actions, I want to invite you in this moment to make a donation. It might be your first donation of the night. Maybe it might be your second donation of the night. You know, it's never too late to give twice. Uh, but yeah, take a moment to go to our link that's going to be dropped in the chat uh, to make sure that we can take action in moments of disaster. I know this week our national organizers have been uh, coaching Sunrisers in uh, New Orleans around the tropical storm that's been moving through the Gulf South. Uh, I know that we've been chatting with folks in Boise, uh, Sunrisers, like high school students, about the uh, smoke that's been in the air around their high schools. And so this is ongoing active work uh, that Sunrise is doing. And so if you feel inspired, feel free to click that link and make another donation. And I'm also seeing that we've got a couple hundred dollars from Barbara. Thank you so much, Barbara, for making that donation. So excited to have you in this movement. All right, we've got a match to Rebecca. Okay, folks, thank you for making the Sunrise difference. It's going to take all of us to win the Green New Deal. And next, I wanted to bring us to our round table. Um, uh, we've got an exciting conversation talking about the youth vote and what it's going to take to turn out millions of young people to win this election and defeat Donald Trump. And I wanted to bring my three speakers back up to get this conversation going. I know that I already introduced them through their first names, but I wanna give you a little bit of a sense of who they are as people. And hmm, I will start with Yara. Okay, as you heard from Yara before, they are a campaign organizer with Sunrise National. They are a college student who's been in the movement since they were 15 years old. In their time, they've helped contact millions of voters across the country. They organized uh, a Palestine solidarity encampment at their university campus and just bring a lot of light and love into our movement space. I also wanted to invite Rebecca back up here. Sun Re Rebecca has been a Sunrise fan since 2018. Uh, she's been a climate activist since maybe the rainforest protests in 1988. Oh my God, I've read about those. Uh, Rebecca is a writer, a historian who has published over 20 books on feminism, Western and Indigenous history, and so much more. And I want to call up our last speaker. I wanted to get back up here. Uh, she is a marine biologist, a policy expert, writer, and Brooklyn native. I love that folks in New York always just let you know, I'm from this borough, because it is critical. <laughs> uh, I'm from Old East Dallas, or that's where I currently live, if you're curious. Uh, she is the co-founder of the nonprofit think tank Urban Ocean Lab and has published two books. And so I'm very excited to have these three folks uh, and yeah, excited to get in this co conversation. Um, I want to start off by just asking you guys, um, what do we have to win by electing Kamala Harris? And I'm open to anybody starting. So if you feel spoken to by this question, feel free to take it away. That's the fighting chance, right? That's the chance we need. That's the, um, the sense of possibility. I mean, this is what I think about all day, every day is like, how do we get the best possible climate future? Like, where is there an opportunity? Um, and how can I be useful in helping us to grab it? So that's the possibility um, is the word that I'm thinking about when I think about 
this campaign? What keeps the door open? I got to add 248 years of male presidents or however long it's been feels like enough. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to be in a country that's headed by a woman of color. And I was so excited by the reception of her in July. I'm a San Franciscan, so I voted for Kamala Harris in every election she's ever run in, all of which she won. And I really expected to see more sexism and racism at her um, from our side. And the reception just made me feel like I live in a better country than I used to. That was really exciting. And I just feel like we crossed this one finish line, which I also know isn't when any of us finish our work, but I think it's a real finish line for MAGA. I, Donald Trump has no future past this election. The Republic, he's run the Republican Party into the ground. Um, the demographic shift keeps on coming. Thank you, young people of color. Thank you, old white people for dying. I won't do that yet, but. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then we really get to work. One of the reasons I love Sunrise is that, you know, every day is a work day and election victory is to be celebrated. And then you get to work to get those politicians uh, to do what they need to do to push it further to ask for more, you pass good legislation, you see how you can build on that. I love that you guys never give up, never stop, dream big. And God knows a lot of people in this country, their long-term strategy seems like lunch. And to see Sunrise have another six-year plan, like the one that brought us the Green New Deal, I just find super exciting. And nothing against all white people in general, but we are the demographic that votes Republican overall. Not as college educated California ladies, but overall. So the demographic shift is awesome. That was a big rant. I do that. Sorry. <laughs> it was a good rant. Arr. When I was, sorry. <laughs> when I was in Chicago last month with some staff members and the volunteer leadership team of Sunrise, we were talking about this big plan that's gonna take us through 2028, 2029, 2030. And I think about my younger siblings. I have one younger sister that I grew up with, but um, growing up queer in a red state gave me a lot of adopted younger siblings. And with the past four years, my summer job always being teaching at a middle school program, I have so many adopted younger siblings who are at this point like 14 to 17 years old. And I'm thinking about what the next four years means for them. Because if you're a student, you can clock it out on an academic calendar. I was talking to a 10th grade organizer a few weeks ago and I was like, okay, this is the plan. We're gonna be doing these actions in 2027. We're gonna elect a Green New Deal president in 2028. And she was not along with me. She's like, okay, so I'll be a sophomore in college. Yeah, I can plan my class schedule for that. And I love talking to kids in grade school who know exactly where they'll be in four years and exactly what better climate policies will mean for them. It means completing your senior year in high school in a building with air conditioning. It means getting to take environmental science courses that actually teach you about the climate crisis when you're in 11th grade and taking your exams, studying something that is true and useful. It means... One of the kids I mentored two summers ago, his name is Julian, and I ran into him over the summer. Um, he was telling me all about how he wants to go to college and major in psychology, and he'll be the first person in his family to go to college. So in order to pay for it, he works over the summer, he works outside in landscaping. And so I'm thinking about how with the extreme heat waves, we need a president who will lead us through the emergency of extreme heat so that Julian doesn't get hurt trying to pay for his college education that he's so determined to have. Um, so thinking about what a Harris administration would mean for this timeline that every child already has for their education is really grounding to me because we, we are long-term thinkers. The climate crisis is a shadow over the rest of our lives, but we're also ready to go right now. And I know how the policies we squeeze in in 2025, 2026 are so going to turbocharge the bright young people around me. Fantastic. I love hearing from you guys. Okay. Um, next question. Where do you see the role of young people in this election cycle? Um, what do you think they should be doing? Should we ask a young person? 
<laughs> I think we should start with a young person. This makes sense to me. Oh my goodness, I love this question. I was just on a call right before this with the three teenagers who lead the phone bank team. And we were talking about what the last week, like the November 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th is going to look like. And our like working slogan for this brainstorm Google document is we can't vote, but we will win. Like our goal is to get middle schoolers and high schoolers begging their parents for a day off of school so that they can phone bank on Tuesday, like emailing their teachers can I catch up on this test later? Can I have it moved to after the election? Sorry, I'm volunteering with Sunrise. It's a highly educational opportunity and the most important election of my lifetime so far. Um, we have so much at stake and young people know this. We all know the political problems. I think our role is to talk to each other about recognizing political solutions. So when young people organize each other, if you're old enough to vote, it's like, God damn it, go vote. Um, my friend who leads the theater group on our campus requires a COVID test and proof of your voter registration before you show up to Tech Week, um, which I think is a very good example of college students organizing each other. And the fact is, if you're 16 and you are so close but so far away from voting in this election, the bare minimum that adults are allowed to do, you can vote and do nothing else and you participated. But for young people, the bare minimum is a volunteer shift because you don't have the option of voting and nothing else. If you want to make a difference, you have to talk to people and you have to get out there and post on Instagram. So I think there's really nothing young people can't do with the exception of some of us aren't ineligible to vote and that makes them mad enough to volunteer more. So I'll actually pass it to um, the other two speakers who have seen more elections to answer that question too, because I think you have some expertise I don't. Ayana, you I want to just, The thing that I'm um, thinking about, I just, I, I, I spoke at the, um, I think 2019 um, global climate strike in New York City. And when I was trying to think about what to say then to all those young people, like 300,000 in the streets of lower Manhattan, I was the the thing I wanted to say was just like thank you for offering this like incredibly valuable moral clarity and reminding older folks that like this is on us we can't actually like turn it over to the youth right people are like the kids are on it I'm like no 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 <laughs> they're trying to like get us to step up to where we need to be and I think the moral clarity of young people is so critically important because you can say stop setting my future on fire and what are people going to say like oh it's no big deal don't worry about it right I think the ways in which young people can just with no bullshitting, just tell it like it is um, and hold other, you know, older folks feet to the fire is critical. So like Yara was saying, like we, like what we need for you is to tell all of us who are old enough to vote to not screw this up um, and to, to be there um, to support you. Um, and, you know, in many cases, follow your lead and link arms and to see how far we can get together. I think that backstage at that rally, uh, I was watching um, Greta Thunberg speak. I was standing next to Bill McKibben and it was this moment where I was like, oh, we've got a three generation movement now. Like, what can we do if three generations of climate activists get together? And I think that's the really exciting moment is how much we each have to learn um, from each other. And, and here we are on this call, three generations deep, trying to see what we can do together. So just more of this, I guess, is my answer. Let me jump in. I got to say my oldest climate activist friend is 92. My youngest climate activist friend just started sixth grade. I have been watching Sunrise with admiration since 2018, but there's also this kind of undercurrent in the climate movement and the people who fund the climate movement that kind of sounds like young people are so awesome, let them do it. And it's everybody's job. I love that Bill McKibben organized Third Act to get us people over 60 out into the streets. My 92-year-old friend is part of the Rockings Chair Rebellion. And uh, 
you know, I just also love intergenerational relationships. I'm hoping as a third act board member to do more with Sunrise and to really just show up as, you know, the, you know, multi-generational because we're also look, you know, we all care about the future. Some of us are going to be here longer. I'm an aunt and great aunt to people who, if all goes well, will make it to the 22nd century. But, you know, we all, we, Anybody who ha is, has enough freedom, enough power, enough well-being to do something has got to do something. I find young people right now are visionary. I found that with feminism and queer rights, that they grew up without some of the hindrances that were normal when I was growing up. It's like they're standing on the next mountain past us and they see further. So I get asked sometimes, like, what do you want to tell young people? And I'm like, they're they're teaching me, not the other way around. So... That's some of the stuff I think about this, and I want to support the young people. I'm super inspired by Yara. Now I just want to follow you around or invite you to come and stay in San Francisco, do a little queer history tour. And um, But, you know, we're in it together. And the basic teaching of climate change is everything is connected. It really is. It really is. Okay, fantastic. Um, I would also love uh, an invitation to a queer history tour of San Francisco. Um, all righty, next question. What would you say to people disillusioned by the climate crisis and politics today? What would you say to inspire them? Um, yeah, take it away, folks. I would say I get it. Like, if this is the this is the long haul, it's totally normal to be like, oh, it's really a lot. I need a break. Um, and it is big and there aren't enough people in this work yet. And so what we need to do is find ways to make it like delightful, irreverent, goofy, right? Like we can take the climate crisis seriously without taking ourselves seriously, right? There's like nothing stopping all of us from dancing right now on this Zoom, right? <laughs> so I feel like that's the opportunity, right? To just like wiggle around a little bit and like try to make a better party like if we throw a better party more people will want to come hang out with us it's sort of like the lesson I didn't learn in high school which is like whatever those kids can go be cool over there but now I'm like everyone come to my club party we're like dealing with climate solutions it's so fun um so I feel like that's a big part of where I want to see this go um and just have like more imagination as part of it like what could be um, I'm clearly obsessed with this, you know, what if we get it right questions. I just wrote a book about it, but I feel like that's the thing that keeps me going is like, what if, what if, oh, <laughs> thank you. Got my advanced copy. Everyone needs one. Rebecca wrote the most lovely blurb for my book and we'll be in conversation together in Berkeley, October 1st. Um, you know, friends who big you up is always a big part of what this is about. I mean, I think we just need to have each other's backs and um, not forget that we are making the future. And so the other question that I'm sort of obsessed with is what if we act as if we love the future? What would we do? What would that look like? Um, yeah, so I'm feeling actually like really sparkly about all the possibilities even though the odds are long I mean what's the alternative like give up on the future of life on earth like give up on all these wonderful species like give up on um you know sweet summer days and all of that I mean I'm like even if we don't get a hundred percent of what we want 80 percent is better than zero and so we just have to try and try and try and try I'll jump in I often find myself saying, I respect despair as an emotion, but don't confuse it with an analysis. I totally get, you know, we're looking at destruction, corruption, hate, you know, a, a bunch of genocides going on in different parts of the world, looking at people who know what's at stake and are choosing to destroy the earth looking at so many forms of harm going around and it hurts and it weighs on you it takes a toll i don't think people are really okay right now between trump the pandemic what the internet has done to us and climate catastrophe but i also think you know don't 
don't take your despair for an analysis. One thing I find really striking is people out kind of outside the climate movement often think it's too late. There's nothing we can do. No one cares. We never win. The deeper in you go, you find out that, first of all, you get to hang out with a bunch of amazing people, like the people up here, everybody here who passionately care. And activists are some of the best people. They're not all perfect, but you can spend your life with that joy, that energy, that commitment, that generosity, that heroic willingness to risk, you know, even your bodily well-being for what you believe in. So, you know, and we have an incredible history of victories behind us. I loved hearing the Climate Corps called out. That campaign was amazing. We stopped the Keystone XL pipeline. We passed what started out as a Green New Deal and ended up as the imperfect but epic Inflation Reduction Act. And so much like, you know, I have a five page what we've won section in my not too late anthology I did with Thelma, young Lieutenant Tabua and 20 other amazing people from around the world. But, um, so I also think we kind of, you know, we need to do the work, but I also grew up in a left that just thinks there's no room for joy, beauty, pleasure, dance parties, et cetera, we should just grind all the time. I, people need to take care of themselves and we're in this for the long haul. Sometimes you need to take a day, a week, a month, a year off to go do something that feeds your heart and soul. And so, and those things are compatible. There's a wonderful metaphor people use sometime about singing in choir, which I shouldn't use because I can't sing to save my, well, I can't carry a tune to save my life. And, um, but which is that, you know, the choir as a whole carries the tune and people can stop and take, take a breath in there. You can stop and take a breath sometimes. And we're here to take care of everything and you're part of it. So I want to see people take care of themselves, take care of their emotional lives and recognize what we're fighting for is a world in which everyone matters. Everyone has value, a world in which we have beauty, joy, pleasure and a glorious thriving natural world that will outlast our species. And so also like go out and enjoy that natural world, get your dance parties on. I want, I want to see people be balanced activists. And that's kind of how I feel about, about this part of it. Organizing as a college student, um, I have a lot of conversations with folks where it feels like you, you have school and if you do activism it's an extracurricular activity maybe you have you don't have the energy for it so you drop off for a few months and you come back to it that that is a very heavy way to think about activism as um a burden or a sacrifice that you're making but something that really changed the the game and the conversation at least on this campus was our encampment when so many people realized like if you're disillusioned with politics, well, your life is political anyway, and you can't be disillusioned with that. So you have to live politically anyway, and we're going to do it together on this lawn in these tents together. And when we sat down and just, I mean, we had marches, we had workshops, we did teach-ins, but there was a lot of downtime to connect with other young organizers and truly talk about um, what, the, what the movement has given people and the niche that people have found there. Um, I have some friends who are like, definitely afraid of phone calls and will never phone bank for a political candidate but like set them out on the lawn with some paint brushes and some cardboard and like they will organize the most beautiful welcoming chill art builds that you'll ever find um after the encampment I had one friend who leaned into like I'm gonna get really into politics and I'm gonna lobby I'm gonna take the 40 minute train to Capitol Hill and I'm gonna talk to politicians and another friend who was like I know personally, I will not be able to talk to a Republican without punching them in the face for a couple months. So I'm going to sit on campus and help organize our transgender mutual aid network. And like both of these are completely valid. And in order to have a big functional movement, we need everybody doing different things. As long as somebody's covering it, you don't have to do every form of activism you are offered. That has helped me a lot. If I'm getting a, I mean, after the encampment, I took a big nap and I took a week to pivot away from my Palestine work. I visited my family in Missouri and I did the trans rights advocacy that I'd been 
neglecting while I was out of the state. There's like, there's always something to do that you can keep switching gears and keep keeping your brain happy. You can get that change of scenery while still fighting for the better future that is like the, the same goal. Um, I love making friends who have completely different journeys into activism and completely different like daily lives in the movement. But because we're all fighting for the same Green New Deal, it works so well. So what I would say to most people disillusioned with politics that I talk to, most young people, is just because they don't, they haven't expanded their view of what's available to them. It's people telling me, I, I don't want to phone bank. I don't want to talk to strangers. And I'm like, well, you can do this other thing. And they're like, oh, that's also politics. I'll do that. Give me that. Um, I think we just need to make more young people aware of the options available to them and how the sheer variety of ways you can be in this movement is exciting and gets people signing up. Thank you all for sharing. Okay, we've got space for one other question. I'd be really excited to get something from the folks that have been listening from our great speakers. And so if you've got a question you'd love one of these folks or all these folks to answer, please feel free to drop it in the chat. I'll give you a second or two to come up with your perfect question in this very moment. Miles, you're completely right. Introverts can also donate. Key, key solution. You know, you're going to need organized people and organized resources, i.e. money, to win the Green New Deal. And that's what part of this call is about. All right. Seeing Annette mentioning that if you don't like phone calls, you can actually write postcards to urge people to vote. That's true. It's a very exciting and honestly relaxing way of participating in the election. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if anyone's got a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. If not... I'll come up with one. I'm chock full of them. Maybe a second or two. All right. Yes, Yara highlighting that there's some folks that are immunocompromised and might not be able to knock doors or go to protests, but they sure can uh, do some phone banking. Barbara, we are focusing on particular swing states, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona. We're also doing some phone and text in um, uh, Georgia and looking about how to do direct actions there as well. Um, okay, I'm getting incredibly practical questions, like where are you phone banking and how can I do some postcarding? And I want to answer those questions, but not exactly what I was going for with the panel. So coming in with a new question. Um, Hmm. Was there a moment where you lost hope and how did you get it back again? Which feels similar to the last one, but I love hearing, you know, organizing can be challenging. What brought you to? It's always nature, unlike the losing hope and the getting it back, right? The the despair of you know, oh gosh, things are changing so fast and the places that the species that I love are so at risk. And then you go outside and like, I literally hug trees. <laughs> and just like being surrounded by life and knowing that it's persisting despite the odds. Um, and, you know, just, just watching life continue to try. And I'm like, okay, well, if this seedling is still at it, like I'm going to go back and see what more life I can nurture as well. And I wrote a book about hope and I don't think I ever lose hope, but my hope gets tired and worn out sometimes. But something that keeps me going is um, that my, you know, our enemies want us to give up. The fossil fuel industry wants us to believe they're so powerful, we'll never defeat them. The Republicans want us to believe that they're this great, huge power and, you know, they're all losing and but it's also like our enemies want us to give up so the hell with giving up uh i'm not going to give them what they want i'm not going to say oh i have no power oh we can't win etc and uh you know hope for me i always think of mariam kaba's famous line hope is a discipline it's a commitment and you know i see people in, in native american land rights struggles uh, facing immediate devastation who don't give up because giving up means that essentially they're going to die their kids will die they'll be permanently dispossessed the dictator will rule forever the land will be completely destroyed and so 
I get a lot of inspiration from these people in much tougher situations. Uh, the Zapatistas, for example, I was just in Mexico, who don't give up. And so, you know, it's like I said about despair. The emotions waver, but the commitments for me don't. And sometimes you got to go recharge. I thought immediately of a story where I didn't lose faith or lose hope in my movement, but I lost hope in my ability to stay at a particular action. It was the Palestine encampment on my campus. I had a lot of roles there, one of them including jail support, which was pretty intense. And I was standing outside in the heat after basically not sleeping for three days. Um, drones are flying overhead. There's campus public safety, Baltimore Police Department, um, private security everywhere. Um, we're hearing, of course, that administration is about to have us all arrested, and we're not really sure how true that is. Um, I stood up and gathered the entire encampment in a circle. I said, I am very tired and I'm not going to do a good job facilitating, so I'm going to stand here until you elect your facilitator, your moderator. Um, my vision started going blurry as they were voting who the moderator was going to be. And then as soon as my friend Mark stood up to kind of like get them through that moment, I promptly burst into tears and a medic had to carry me out. Um, when I was in the car, I was told later by my friend who was the medic, like, Yara, you just kept saying, I can't keep them safe. I can't keep them safe. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> that that's quite dramatic of me. Um, we went back to her house and... I got, I took a shower. She lent me some pajamas. She made me a yogurt bowl. We listened to music and we, we just talked about my hopes at the start of the encampment, what I thought was still winnable and what I wished was still winnable. And then she's like, are you ready to go back? And I did. We stayed another two weeks. We were one of the encampments that actually won a deal from our administration. Um, I was so, so proud. And by the time we broke it down, no one had been arrested. No one had been hurt as I had so feared. And so it was that my relationship with that medic who put her arms around me, escorted me out for a little bit to take the time I need, and then also was the one bringing me back. She didn't give up on me like, <laughs> Yara is done with activism for the week, but she really trusted me on that and brought me back. Um, and that is something that has happened at Sunrise as well. I threw down so hard in the 2020 elections and even phone banked for an extra month than I thought I would because of the Georgia runoffs that I was I was so tired and behind on my classes for several months. I didn't think I was going to come back to the phone banking team had it not been for my friends who literally texted me and they're like, Yara, we miss you. Are you going to come back? So at the times when I see that like we've lost primaries I really care about, like Jamal Bowman's race or Corey Bush's race, I'm still on the phone bank team because I am not giving up on my friend Emma and I will not miss out on our weekly calls there. So it's my friendships that keep me in the movement. And then as long as I'm here in the room, I keep getting slapped in the face with how powerful we are and how effective we are. So I can always persuade myself into remembering that this is actually the most awesome thing I do. And I'm going to stick around because of my friends. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for giving such full, heartful answers to those questions. Um, I want to close out our roundtable here, but before I close it out, let's get some pluses in the chat for our speakers. It's always beautiful hearing from you guys and always exciting to be in a movement fighting for the Green New Deal with you. Uh, okay, lovely seeing the pluses coming in. Uh, and we are quickly approaching our favorite time of an online fundraiser. The moment where I bring you to the big, big question, if you haven't made a donation, if you're feeling super excited to do it again. But before I do so, I want to tell you a little story about myself. Uh, so as I said before, uh, my name is still Kitas. I joined Sunrise in 2020. Uh, I had been living in Ethiopia before the pandemic began, uh, where I'm originally from. Uh, in Addis Ababa, I found myself taking writing classes and sitting on the couches of my cousin's cousin's second wife twice removed from divorce uh and honestly just walking around the streets of my hometown um but then the pandemic began and the program that I was on ended and I moved back to Texas where I originally grew up um I grew up in the Dallas area where I'm calling in from and I started searching for organizing that could mean something back home in Ethiopia and for me, that looked like climate organizing. I thought 
if I fought for climate action in the U.S. where ExxonMobil and Chevron are headquartered, that it could mean something real and tangible to uh, the folks that are walking the streets of Addis Ababa today. Uh, and so I decided to organize. But if I'm being fully honest with you, I decided to organize, but I didn't necessarily believe that we could win. I thought that I should be responsible for at least trying. Uh, and so when I was back in Texas, uh, it was 2020 and I was at protests. I ran into this guy named Sonny. At the time, Sonny was the hub coordinator or top leader in the Sunrise Dallas hub. And I started chatting with him. Uh, and he asked me several times to join the movement and join the hub. And a couple of times I turned him down, but eventually I was like, yeah, why not? I'm supposed to try. So I guess I'll try. Uh, and so I joined the hub and I started coordinating our 2020 electoral work. Our hub at that time did hundreds of thousands of voter contact attempts. Uh, I remembered spending my weekends like two or three times on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday, uh, launching dozens of canvassers to elect state house candidates. Uh, I spent my time onboarding new young folks into our movement to get them activated and organizing. Uh, and after a couple of months, I also became a hub coordinator with Sunny. And at that time, uh, I still thought, I'm supposed to try. I don't know if we're going to win. I don't know if winning's really on the horizon. But I thought, at the very least, I should try for the people back home. Uh, and so I told myself, I'm going to do this for a little bit. I'll finish my virtual grad program. And then maybe I'll move back to Addis or maybe I'll move back to New York. Um, but then February 2021 happened. And in February 2021 in Texas, the lights turned off and they didn't come back on for a week. It got cold, then colder, then so cold you got too numb to tell the difference. And for the first couple of hours, our hub didn't know what to do. Uh, we didn't know where to reach. We didn't know what to organize. We didn't know what to do. But after a little while, we found one another and we decided to do mutual aid. We decided to organize for one another. Um, by the next day, we had created a Google form to take in requests for food and necessities. Uh, we connected with our partners and started making sandwiches and getting warm clothing together. Uh, we started an ad hoc delivery service to get goods to families and elderly people in the Dallas Metroplex. We started raising money and started sending it out just as quickly as it started coming in. And by the end of it, we had raised $54,000 and we had distributed $54,000 to thousands of people that were in need in that moment. Um, and in that space of time during the Texas freeze, I thought to myself that this organizing was about more than this trying. It was about more than just like knocking in and saying, ah, the climate crisis is bad. Let me just do this thing on the side. And that was about our lives and our futures. That it was about the regular folks in Texas who expected, rightfully so, that their energy system would not fail them, that the deregulation of the Texas grid uh, would not impact their lives and their communities in such a horrendous way, um, and that we deserved so much more from our government and our politicians. And so in that moment, in February of 2021, I decided to switch from just trying to win the Green New Deal to deciding that I absolutely had to. And so I started saying yes in a way that I wasn't before. A couple of months before that, I was launching these canvases and I was trying, but I wasn't feeling the fire burning inside my soul in the right ways. Um, and the Texas Feast changed that for me. Um, and so a couple of months later, when Sunrise started fighting for Build Back Better, uh, the original bill that became the Inflation Reduction Act, me and my hub said yes. It wasn't just, we're going to try. It was, damn it, we have to fucking win. And so my hub said yes to marching hundreds of miles from New Orleans to Houston to fight the climate crisis. We said yes to highlighting the ways that the big oil and the fossil fuel industry is poisoning black and brown working class communities up the bayous of Louisiana and in the coast of Texas. We said yes to fighting for ourselves every single day that we walked another mile and another mile and another mile. And we continued to organize at that um, White House uh, encircling that Yara was mentioning earlier on this call, where we shut down all 12 gates of the White House. And we continued to fight for over a year to pass the first piece of climate legislation uh, that our federal government had really substantially passed. And when it came in a very critical moment in that fight to say yes to higher escalated action, uh, me and my friends said yes to going on hunger strike. And we said yes to limiting food consumption in our bodies, 
over days and weeks for half a month to make sure that that climate bill passed so that the industry and politicians would recognize that young people take climate action incredibly seriously and that we're not just here to try, but we're here to win for our futures. And so if you are on this Zoom call and you find yourself just sort of trying, you find yourself just sort of opening up a Sunrise email every couple of weeks and being like, that's really nice that those folks are trying over there. I want to invite you into committing to win. I want to invite you into fighting for the Green New Deal as if you need it, as if it's in your very blood, as if you're ready and desperate to vote, organize, strike your way into the better world that you deserve and that your family and friends deserve. And one of the most critical ways that you can do that is by making a critical donation to our work. Sunrise has big plans for this election. We're already underway and we continue to continue building bigger and bigger. We plan to talk to millions of voters in swing states and make the difference to win this election. And after November 5th happens, we plan to continue organizing. We plan to continue talking to our neighbors. We can plan to continue taking action in moments of disaster and we can plan to win. And so if you are ready, if you're ready to win the Green New Deal, if you're ready to defeat Donald Trump in November, if you're ready to create the better futures that we all deserve, if you're ready to fight for not incredibly hot summers and regular winter storms and not polar vortexes, if you're ready to see a future where we get on a Zoom call and we just celebrate our wins because we've already won everything that we deserve, everything that we know and need, I want you to take a moment and make a donation. And I wanna give you a second to make that donation. And I wanna to name to you that we are currently at $8,290. And it would make me feel so hopeful about our winning if we cross the 10,000 mark. And so I wanna give you a moment to make maybe your first donation of the night, to maybe make your second donation of the night, or to make your 50th donation to Sunrise Movement, to make sure that we can win this election and get to the futures that we know we all deserve. And so I'm gonna do that thing where I stop talking and I'm just gonna look at you for a moment and I'm gonna let you type in your credit card number, maybe your debit card number, uh, maybe you hit recurring donation, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I wanna give you a moment to make the difference that really counts. Rebecca, I definitely agree. Yes, we can celebrate our victories as they're coming in because they definitely are coming in. I'm keeping a list. Nice. And yeah, November 6th should be a big celebration, even though we're going to have to fight to defend this victory. Definitely. All right. And as those donations are coming in, I'm curious if there are any folks who've already made donations that might want to just come off mute and share why they donated. And so if anyone feels inspired to tell their story or tell us what they're fighting for, feel free to speak up and let us know. I'm getting a message that maybe Barbara wants to speak. Barbara, if you want to share why you made a donation, <laughs> feel free to go for it. Hi, Gitas. Um, hi, y'all. Um, why I made a donation. I have been part of the Sunrise Board for five years now um, and more inspired as time goes on. Um, and I do firmly believe that Sunrise is one of the few organizations that can actually help us win this election, that can make it happen because they can turn out young people to vote. Um, I think we all know what the difficulties are, what the issues are, what the problems are in getting people to vote. And I think Sunrise is one of the few organizations that can actually um, get us over that hurdle with young people and get them enthusiastic about getting out and winning. Um, because we all know we have to defeat Donald Trump <laughs> and, um, the way to do that is to do voter turnout in key states and everywhere. So uh, that's why I'm giving my time and my money to Sunrise, hoping that that will make the difference. So thank you all. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, if anyone else is feeling inspired to share, feel free to do so. Thank you. 
Hmm. I couldn't agree more, Rebecca. All right, seeing that money coming in, seeing it increase. What a fun way to spend our Thursday nights, you know, like a little round table conversation. Um, the fundraiser is actually just a way for me to spend time with Rebecca, Ayana, and Yara on a Zoom call. Uh, so thank you everybody for making that possible for me. All right, I wanna shout out some folks. Seeing uh, Natalie gave some money. Thank you so much for making it happen. Uh, Yara for being a dues paying member in this movement and giving on the regular. Uh, seeing Ayana make another donation. Thank you so much. Seeing Jesse giving in funds. It takes all of us to build this movement. Thank you so much. Um, and as we get close, to wrapping up our call, I want to give us a moment to come all off mute. Uh, I know online Zoom calls can feel a lot of like, oh, I feel so distant from folks, but I also think it's kind of amazing that we're all across this country and can hear and see one another. And once you come off mute, what should we say? Hmm. Have you ever cheered on a Zoom call? It's slightly awkward, but kind of fun. Uh, I want to invite you into a slightly awkward, fun thing we can do online um, to maybe cheer. And I'm not quite sure yet what we'll cheer, but maybe we'll just do Green New Deal. So I want you to find your unmute button. If your camera's off, maybe turn on your camera. Um, and I'll count us off and you'll hear green at slightly different times and that's part of the fun. And so, Three, two, one. Three new deals. 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 Green new deals. Green new deals. Green new deals. Green new deals. Who has the melody? That was perfect. Honestly, it's better when it's a cacophony, isn't it? Um, all righty. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time and 